Good afternoon, everybody. It's great to see you all. A couple of announcements as we get going today. I see my camera has done its thing that it usually does, which is freeze um, just at the moment that I do not want it to. So I'm going to switch to my inferior camera, but it's better than nothing. Um, so some announcements to begin with. I am going to tape every lecture, including once we go back in person. And actually, I did not hear the recording start. No, it says that it's recording. So this lecture is being recorded, great. And when we go back in person, which I believe is next Monday, I will also be recording the lecture. I'll be posting them up to B courses. I did that for last Wednesday's lecture. I'll do it for today's lecture. I'll do it all the way forward. Sometimes there'll be a little bit of a delay on getting it through, um, uh, but you know, by the end, by that evening, it should be up on the website. The other thing that I'm going to do, I have office hours today for half an hour after the lecture. On Wednesday, office hours for half an hour after the lecture. Come Monday, given that we're going back in person, I think I'll divide the office hours so that people who would prefer to be on Zoom for office hours can be, and people who want to be in person, say, outside and socially distanced after the lecture can be. So I'll, I'll and if we get like a strong interest in one of those and zero interest in the other, we'll kind of rethink. But at the moment, I really want to, people who, don't want to come in person, set things up so that you don't have to. And people who do want to come in person, I want to set things up so that you can. Um, so great. Um, let's begin with our second lecture. Today, I wanted to continue to think about the background. Last Wednesday, we thought about the unusual and very difficult backdrop to our course, difficult in that it means mental health challenges for many, many people, these two pandemics. Um, and so that is a, a, a backdrop that we're going to keep coming back to. But here's another set of background information I want you to have. I think, first of all, it probably surprises people that the scientific validation of treatments, um, mental illness treatments, began in the 1950s. I think often people think that, you know, we should have been doing this for a lot longer than that. So, you know, it's a relatively recent science. So maybe that partially explains why we kind of haven't progressed too much as a field. Now, at first, there were really major drug discoveries, the antipsychotics, the antidepressants, but particularly at first, there were side effects and still now um, concerns about side effects among many people who are taking these medications. And so this really pushed forward the development of what we refer to as evidence-based psychological treatments. I'm going to define what these are and try to wrap you around your head around what these are and what these are not is going to help you because we're going to be focusing on these treatments in our course. So evidence-based psychological treatments. So the assumption underpinning these treatments is that the challenges we experience in our lives arise because of an interplay between emotions, thoughts, and actions, or in other words, our affect, our cognitions, and our behaviors. And so that's kind of a fundamental building block of a lot of evidence-based psychological treatments. Another building block is that we can build mental health habits 
that will help us to cut into the vicious cycles that we have in our lives, whereby, you know, we have a catastrophic thought, it kind of gives us a rush of anxiety, and then we do something to manage that. Maybe that something is not that helpful to us, say like drinking a lot of alcohol or taking a lot of drugs. And sometimes that is helpful to us, like taking three deep breaths or going on a walk in nature. So, you know, there are more sophisticated, I shouldn't say more sophisticated, but these treatments do also have some mental health habit strategies that we can be taught to use like negative automatic thought forms that I'll actually give you examples of throughout our course and you can try them on yourself. I think one of the most important things about becoming a mental health provider of any kind is trying it yourself on your own sort of challenges and problems. We all have challenges and problems. We all have negative thoughts. We all have anxiety, depression, you know, other emotions. So these are good things that I, I will want to share with you throughout our course. And these are actually the most studied of all the psychosocial interventions, evidence-based psychological treatments. So this is why we are going to focus here. Now, you know, I would love to do like eight courses on treatments for psychological health problems like a whole degree of psychology on psychological health problems because there's so much to cover. So that's why we've got this particular focus, evidence-based psychological treatments as our focus because we can't possibly cover or every part of mental health in one course. That's why you, many of you will head off to grad school. So I wanna reduce confusion by offering some synonyms. Evidence-based psychological treatments is one term, and I'm gonna try and use that term, but I might lapse into some of these other terms. And certainly some of the readings that you'll do might lapse into some of these other terms. They all mean the same thing. Um, please bring to my attention, you know, confusions about terminology. So another term that's a synonym is a psychosocial treatment or a psychological treatment, or, and it includes cognitive behavior therapy, dialectical behavior therapy, mindfulness-based cognitive therapy, acceptance and commitment therapy, um, and others. So we are gonna have some guest lectures, certainly on dialectical behavior therapy. Um, and we will definitely also cover cognitive behavior therapy. Um, and, you know, some of these other ones, you might be interested in Googling up and, and learning a little bit about them because they're super interesting and important. So something else to say um, that I think is good grounding as we move into talking about these treatments is that we have to think about the fact that these treatments in general have been developed by white people for white people and that we really have to think about which parts do and do not translate and which parts do and do not perpetuate existing disparities in delivering treatments, in delivering treatments that are acceptable to people, that are culturally adapted, that are being delivered by people with cultural competence. Um, so, you know, if evidence-based psychological treatments are really going to remain at the forefront where they are now, I think as a field, we need to completely relook at them from the lens of disparities and of cultural adaptations and um, asking ourselves hard questions about these treatments currently. And so the interventions and who we are as providers are embedded within a socioeconomic cultural context. So we really have to keep that in mind as well. So please do 
you know, ask questions about this theme, keep us focused on this theme as we go. It's a, a really important theme. Now, some of you might be asking questions like, well, why are we going to focus on these treatments and why CBT? You know, as I said, the, huge, the intervention field is huge, way too much for one cause. And the evidence base is really strong for psychosocial treatments. Remember back to last lecture? Um, no, it's got to be this lecture. Uh, I will talk to you about how one fairly biologically oriented psychiatrist drew attention to the very strong scientific base for these treatments. And, you know, it's so strong that these are the treatment of choice for many problems. They're the frontline treatments. And actually the side effect profile is very low, or it might even be zero for some of the psychological treatments. They're, it's skills-based and it's effective well after the course of treatment has finished. Actually with these treatments, it's not uncommon to take the measure at the post-treatment assessment, take the measure again 12 months later and see an improvement over that time. So that's really interesting for studies where that has happened because what it means is that these skills that we're giving people really make a difference in their lives. We're giving people the skills that they continue on being their own therapist. And that's just huge. That is like such a huge contribution to people's lives. And as I've already kind of tipped my hat at, there's many variants of these treatments and that experts though, to provide these treatments are very scarce. That's another reason that I'm really excited to share them with you all, or at least the fundamental building blocks, because then when you go to graduate school and you're in graduate school, if you're not being taught these treatments, get the students together and say, hey, why aren't we being taught these experience, these, these treatments? We need more providers who are delivering these treatments. Please, as I go through, put answers, um, no, I mean, you can put answers in the chat too, but put your questions in the chat. Um, I, I love to hear from you and I love these um, lectures to be relevant to you. So um, I wanna put out a problem, a solution, then a problem. So this is just to illustrate the points I'm making so far and bring them together to make it like crystal clear. So this is data coming out from the CDC. During February and March, 2021, this is this time last year, suspected suicide attempt, emergency department visits were 50% higher among girls aged 12 to 17 years compared to the same period in 2019. Among boys, it's up by 4%. That is just shocking, isn't it? It's a crisis. I bet some of you, and I certainly do, know people who have suicided during this period. And what we want to do is get every single person who comes to the emergency department with a suicide attempt to get dialectical behavior therapy. This is an amazing treatment. It is so helpful for people who are considering suicide. And you're gonna have two lectures on it by um, a DBT expert. I think you're gonna really enjoy those lectures later on in the semester. But here's the thing, the problem is it's not widely available. So here we have a problem. Here we have a solution, but here we have a really big problem. How are we gonna mount the workforce to deliver these treatments? 
So, you know, this is a critical problem and it's another part of what we're going to cover in our course. Questions of dissemination and implementation, questions of the healthcare structure in this country. Those of you who come from other countries, we'd love to hear about the healthcare system in your country. What are the advantages? What are the disadvantages? I can share some of the um, challenges from the healthcare systems in the countries I come from, Australia and Britain. Um, so this just illustrates what I'm trying to put out here. Um, a problem, we've got an evidence-based psychological treatment, but we just haven't got enough people to deliver it. So in the chat, could you put in any ideas that occur to you as to how we might be able to increase the availability of DBT and other evidence-based treatments. While you're thinking about that and typing hopefully a couple of answers, let me go to the chat because I see some thoughts um, already here. Could you explain a little bit more about the EBTs, like how people use this as a treatment? And I know someone who tried to get DBT and it was like a, a year long wait list. Absolutely, you know, that's typical. But DBT is just one of those treatments we've got to make widely available. So what it's like if you receive one of these treatments is it's typically a 50 minute session with a trained provider. Um, these days, often it's on Zoom. There's probably some that have gone back in person. Um, and in that session, usually the provider would set an agenda for the session, ask you if you wanted to change the agenda. You'd spend time in the treatment, learning some skills and applying them to problems that are going on in life right now. And then there would be a home project to practice those skills in between the session. And that home project is probably the most important part of the treatment because that ensures that the 50 minute session gets out and has an impact on real life. And it depends on the treatment. If it's a sleep treatment, it's probably eight sessions. If it's a treatment for depression, it might be more like 26 sessions. That's what the evidence base, so it is a problem when the TANG Center can only offer a much smaller number of sessions than the evidence base indicates. Um, there are resource problems, of course, that make you know, insurance companies and providers only be able to give a limited number of sessions. So let's have a look, how do we make it available? Make it online. Digital technologies are super interesting, a whole domain of development that's taken off in a huge way. Very exciting. Um, education to providers. Yes, we have to work out a way that providers in the field now who didn't get the most up-to-date evidence-based psychological treatments can get the education that they need at minimal cost, minimal time investment. They haven't got time. They're busy to get the education, to deliver these telehealth services, absolutely. Train more providers. We need money to do that, and that is critical. Absolutely. A lot of the insurance companies are looking for ways to cut costs on mental health care provision. So the thought of training more providers is like, well, we're going to need more money to do that. And, you know, there's just a resistance to putting more money toward this really important goal, make some kind of online program fabulous. This is good. Everyone has um, heating on these important issues, insurance providers have to expand coverage. This is just essential. We're going to talk about insurance companies, at least in this country. It's a tricky um, country to be thinking about these problems. I'll say more about why. And of course, there's something like 44 million people who don't even have insurance in this country. So providing affordable insurance or free insurance is another big ticket issue. 
incentives to therapists, great idea for um, taking courses, government funded programs that focus primarily on providing EBT, evidence-based psychological treatments, so important. Now the question is, how do we get our voices to the government? So what I've started actually doing is I keep an eye on government announcements that are RFIs, requests for information. And I'm part of a team that is working with the Association for Psychological Science, um, APS, to respond to those RFIs to the government to get this information to them. My guess is that they just don't even know that these treatments are out there. They just get bombarded with other, um, other kinds of treatments. Lessen the hold for big pharma, really interesting. Annual training and updated teaching, this is great. Educate more people like you so you're going into your graduate programs asking for this, just terrific. And yes, we absolutely need DBT training in more programs across the country. We probably need more programs that are completely just focused on evidence-based psychological treatments, yet required for psych degrees, um, AI programs or robots that look into whether they can provide treatments. Um, I'll go a little bit quicker. Um, yeah, these are all really good. Hopefully you're looking over these and seeing if I'm missing any. Um, now, this one, so important. How do we provide access to low-income people? At the moment, to get DBT, you really have to have not just insurance, but possibly pay out of pocket for it. Now, out of pocket is $200 plus a session. That really kicks out most people, not even just low income people, that kicks out medium income people or in the Bay Area, high income people because the cost of living is so high. Oh, that's an interesting idea. Promote DBT programs in local, middle and high schools. Just fantastic. Maybe we should be training teachers. Um, they're already very busy, but school counselors, great. Um, so you guys are right on it. Fight stigma related to going to therapy. Um, that is so important. Implement mental health education and its importance in schools. Um, just terrific. Oh, so we are going to go into this. Have there been studies in providing therapy delivered over Zoom is effective as in person? We're going to be doing, so hang on, that's a super interesting issue. I will be presenting some lectures on that. Um, and um, yeah, so there is a DBT work, workbook by Matthew McKay that anyone can buy. Um, wonderful. Um, there's also an act workshop that I really, a uh, workbook I really like. It's something like get out of your head and into your life. Um, so it, it's a really good one. Um, and yeah, people with insomnia are always given prescription medicines before sleep treatment. And, you know, particularly even so much for insomnia because there's been so many head to head trials. CBT for insomnia versus medications. And every time CBT is coming up as a frontline treatment, you know, in the practice parameters all over the world, it's like, do CBTI first. So it doesn't make any sense, but we've really got to change the, the sort of action on the ground. Um, and insurance companies, governments, so those of you doing public health, public policy, we're going to need you. But everyone can be writing these response to requests for information. There's a Berkeley City one that has just come out that I'm going to be writing a response to on mental health provision in Berkeley. And of course, in Berkeley, they have fantastic mental health provision. But, you know, I think it's always good to have the voices for evidence-based psychological treatments too. So 
that's a little introduction. Now I want to talk about here's a problem. These data blow my mind every time I consider them. A staggering three in 10 of us will meet diagnostic criteria for a mental health challenge in any 12 month period. And these are not trivial problems. They're way up there with the leading causes of disability worldwide. So, you know, we have cardiovascular health, um, cardiovascular disease, cancer, but right up there in the top 10 is depression, is suicide, you know, other mental health issues. Suicide is the sixth leading cause of death. Now, suicide isn't always associated with a mental illness, but it's typically associated with a mental illness. Rather alarmingly, it's the third leading cause of death in 10 to 14-year-olds. Just wrap your head around that. I can't. It's just too distressing. It's the second leading cause of death among 15 to 24 year olds. Again, just mind blowing. And this global burden of disease study that did an assessment in 1990 and again in 2010, the results published in The Lancet, one of the best journals, showed that globally the rates of mental illness are increasing over that time period. Now, there are certainly changes that have also occurred during that time period, like maybe it is more comfortable to talk about and own mental health problems now. Back in 1990, maybe that was not the case. So there, there might be some methodological contributions to that 37%. But there's some of it that's certainly real, you know, a real increase. So I think to me, the way I read this data is that our current approaches are not sufficient. Now, I think at least part of the problem with our current approaches is that treatment development researchers like myself tend to believe if we build it, they will come. But now I'm going to show you data showing that this is not true. It's not the case that if you come up with the most fantastic treatment in the world, everyone's got to come on board and just use it. Instead, there's a big gap between science and practice. And the specifics are that only a really small percent of the treatment innovations any of us will ever develop, will ever get used in routine practice. And it's pretty interesting, you know, because I've been a treatment development researcher for 20 years, and I only realized this about five years ago. I think it's a perception that you have when you're developing these treatments that someone or other is going to come along and work out how to get them delivered. But I think we've all got to face that that's not going to happen. And in fact, even those that do get implemented into the real world, there's a 15 to 20 year gap between treatment discovery and the incorporation of the new treatments into routine practice. And this is why we've got a new field. It's not new. I'd say it's in its adolescence. It's called implementation science. This is a super interesting area. I hope some of you go into it. You can get into it from many different types of graduate training, from social work, from clinical psychology, from counseling psychology, from public health, from public policy. Um, and it really takes all of those disciplines to come together to make this a very interesting field. I'm going to add in economists, lawyers, um, probably others too. We, it's a very interdisciplinary field. So here's the current bottom line. 
most people diagnosed with a mental illness do not get treated. Now, if that already wasn't hard enough to bear, here's something else that adds to it. When they do studies to look at the quality of the treatments that are being delivered, they see that the majority of people who finally get a treatment, when they get it, they're actually not receiving a minimally adequate treatment and certainly not an evidence-based treatment. So that there is another problem. When clinicians are delivering a treatment, do they know when to refer on to someone else who's got the expertise? Do they know when they've gone as far as they should with the client and they should be saying, look, let me not waste any more of your money and your time. Let me get you to the next phase of working on whatever it is that you're working on. My guess is that this is a surprising finding to you all. It was really surprising to me, you know, that even the treatments that are delivered are not even minimally adequate. And it's a global problem. You know, when we look at low and middle income countries, um, a, a, and again, a really big proportion of people with a mental illness, that's the MI acronym there, um, are not receiving treatment. And almost half of the world's population live in a country where on average, there's one psychiatrist to serve 200,000 or more people. And other mental health care providers who are trained in the use of evidence-based psychological treatments are actually even scarcer. But triggered off that, there's something really exciting that is happening. And that is the use of peer providers and lay providers to deliver um, to, to learn how to deliver treatments. And that's something that the city of Berkeley is looking into um, uh, peer providers. So that's people with lived experience of whatever the challenge is that the service is being provided um, um, for and by. So this is what I referred to earlier, um, Tom Insull. Uh, was the director in, um, uh, of the National Institutes of Mental Health. Um, and actually, before I go there, I am going to pause because I do see some really good comments in the chat and they are on the prior point. So I don't want to leave the prior point um, before we've got to these points here. So what does minimally adequate actually mean? So let's go back a step further here. Whoops, whoops, going in the wrong direction. So what they did is that they worked out a definition of what minimally adequate looks like and what um, adequate looks like and what excellent looks like. And they went into the detailed me medical records. Now, admittedly, medical records have some limitations to them, but they were able to code the um, session by session report for each client um, on the quality of the delivery of the treatment. Now, the best way of doing this study would be to code videotapes of the session with a provider. That would be wonderful, but it's really hard to do that. Um, it's a little bit intrusive to have your session um, uh, videotaped. It might even be a lot intrusive and it's hard um, to mount the resources to actually do that coding. It's very, very time consuming. We do a lot of um, coding of therapy sessions. It's really time consuming. Um, so that's what it, it, it is. It's a definition of it. And the definition depended on the treatment that they were coding. So if the treatment was CBT, did the note 
have mention of key CBT elements or was it mainly a supportive psychotherapy? Now, supportive psychotherapy is really important too. It's part of CBT, but CBT is more than just supportive therapy. Um, and absolutely, um, how are we supposed to get the treatment we need when it's so difficult to even find a provider? Then when we find a provider, we're just finding you know, that they're not giving us what we need. Now, here's the thing, most members of the public don't know what their expectations should be of a provider and they don't know understandably what the evidence-based treatment is. So of course, how do they judge? I was just talking to someone just last week who's telling me about the wonderful therapist he's got for treating his insomnia. And, you know, I looked up that therapist and, um, I, and he told me what was being delivered. It's not the evidence-based treatment for insomnia. So it is, it's, it's very depressing. Um, and there's also huge stigma around preventing people from getting help. Yeah, particularly in certain cultures, for sure, some of the... Um, yeah, so about the implementation gap, what is the main cause of the gap between innovation and treatment? Ah, so this is one of the topics of our course. I think one of the problems is that treatment development researchers like me um, don't have an eye toward implementation during development of the treatment. So we're actually sometimes developing a treatment that is completely unrealistic to implement. And the system is, allows us to do that. So that's called deployment-focused treatment development. And NIMH is really asking us to do that work before we get started on implementing a treatment, on testing a treatment or developing a treatment. Like, check, is it able to be implemented? I think that's one of the problems, but I think there's many problems. And let's keep that question at the forefront of our lectures as we go, you know, what is the main cause of the gap? And let's spot, if you see, aha, this informs the gap between innovation and availability. And please put it in the chat because it's gonna be 10 plus things contributing to it. And it's not until we can work out and articulate those 10 plus things that we can tackle them and get on top of them. So, um, well, see, this is another thing that really worries me. When people have a bad experience with a psychiatrist or a psychologist, why would they go back again? Yet in our lives, I think it is fully appropriate. I certainly have and I will continue to go back to a therapist or get a new one for different challenges, for different transitions. But if we don't have good experiences, we're not going to do that even though we need to. Totally heartbreaking. And it's on us thinking about you all who will become mental health providers to be re really skilled in providing services that um, people will want to be part of, that people have a good experience of. And I think that there are certain things that we can put into our treatment sessions that help with that. So at the end of every session, every CBT session, Every session I run, I ask this question. I want to pause before we finish today and ask, is there anything we spoke about today that was particularly helpful for you or anything that I did or said that was unhelpful for you? I'm asking for feedback and I'm, I'm wanting to develop the relationship and show that it's two-way really important. And my sense is that that helps to build rapport, but there are many other things that build rapport. 
So this is, is wonderful. Ah, so how strong is the evidence for peer mental health? We've got to do some on that. So hang on to that question. This is great because you're right on the money of what it is that we're going to be doing in our course. You're bringing up some of the themes. Some of them I'm kind of answering now. Others of them I'm saying, well, I'm not going to give you the answer now because I want you to come back and stay excited about these issues. And um, are there ways that providers can be held accountable to certain standards of care. That's so important. You know, as we'll see in the United Kingdom, there is a system where data is collected on every single provider in the country. And they are able to have a look at every single provider and every single county um, within the United Kingdom to make sure that they are doing well. Of course, all of us have clients where it wasn't the best fit or it turned out the client had another problem. That data wouldn't be very good. Um, but in general, we should have these checks about the standards of care. Client outcome would be one. Um, there are probably others that we should be looking at. And here in this country, when there's dozens of insurance companies, providers working for different ones, no sort of centralization, it makes it really hard to come up with standards of care. Oh, that's a really important one. And that's actually one I've not thought about for quite some time. I should give that more thought. And so, yeah, a discouraging people um, adds to the stigma that this isn't useful. Oh, so that's interesting, isn't it? Because it's not just that we've got to get these treatments out. We've also got to build um, confidence among people in the community, all of us in the community, that this will actually help us. And so I think that's kind of an interesting angle that I've never thought about before. I do think that's interesting and um, important. Um, exposure to the different therapies and treatments. Okay, great, good. Um, uh, terrific. And we'll be doing the whole last third of our course is going to be focused on actual evidence-based treatments. Um, yes, so, you know, UCSF is one of the big providers of DBT in the Bay Area. Um, it's kind of amazing. Um, the services and the therapists, they're really uh, terrific. We just need many more services like the DBT clinic at UCSF. Um, and yeah, psychiatrists training in EB, evidence-based psychological treatments, these days they do get some training, but they've got to be so expert in so many things. I don't know how much training they're getting, but those of you who are going to go off to be psychiatrists, you know, pressure the courses to bring evidence-based psychological treatments into the courses. Um, you know, so much of psychiatry can be focused on, um, you know, medication management. But these days, you know, CBT for schizophrenia, CBT for bipolar disorder, we know are helpful and really important. Um, so, yeah, we're, I know we've only got a few more minutes and I want to just quickly run through and maybe I'll save this chat and I will... Um, uh, look at it to make sure I haven't missed anything. If I have, I will come back to it. So just food for thought in closing. So this is Tom Insel. At the time he wrote this, he was a director of the National Institute of Mental Health. Now, to the best of my knowledge, during his time at the NIMH, he's a very biologically oriented psychiatrist. He, I think his own research background was neuroscience and biology. But he wrote this very honest article in, again, one of the best um, journals in the field. And he said, look, the NIMH have run these studies of 
10,000 patients across 2,000 sites. These are the largest pharmaceutical trials not supported by drug companies. That's really important so they can completely or as completely as is ever possible, um, you know, not biased. And they're administered by the best psychiatrists in the country. And he said, but look, when we look at the big study of schizophrenia, Katie is the acronym, we see that 74% of patients discontinued their medications. That means that there's probably too many side effects. We want treatments that are acceptable as well as effective. In the big depression study, the outcomes suggest that actually for many people, the depression treatments were not much better than placebo. And similarly for bipolar disorders, some disappointing outcomes. Now there's absolutely a time and a place for medications and it's absolutely appropriate to be on them um, for many, many situations. But Dr. Insel was just drawing attention to that actually the data are much more encouraging for psychosocial treatments even though they don't have television programs saying use Ambien with a big green butterfly flight, you know, blah, blah. Um, and the results are more encouraging, but he noted that few patients actually receive them. So I'm going to review these last three slides when we come back on Wednesday. Let's finish up for now. Thank you all for coming. Remember, we, I'm just going to take like a three minute break and I'll be back for office hours, which will run till half past the hour. So please feel free to stay on for office hours if you would like. I'll be back in three minutes. Thanks, everybody.